Hello everyone, today we are looking at Unearthed Arcana 2021 Mages of Strixhaven. This is written by Mackenzie DeArmas, Dan Dillon, and Jeremy Crawford. And we're just going to jump in because we've got five new subclasses that all are associated with Strixhaven. Now, uh, full disclosure, I had no idea about these Unearthed Arcana other than there would be an Unearthed Arcana. I did not get a previous look or an earlier look at any of these. I didn't know what they were going to be. Uh, I wasn't entirely sure what the theme would even be. So uh, I'm very excited for these. They are very unique. They are groundbreaking for D&D. &D, uh, and I am excited to see them included in how we design subclasses, possibly in the future for Dungeons & Dragons as well. Uh, because I feel like the themes are very strong but also speak to a variety of classes in D&D, &D, and I like that there's no restriction there uh, as much. So let's go ahead and jump into what we are seeing in Unearthed Arcana. This is, uh, this is really fun material for me. I, I really kind of love this type of content. The, the, the fact that you can kind of customize things for yourself always excites me. So this playtest uh, test document for presents five subclasses for Dungeons & Dragons. Each of these subclasses allows you to play a mage associated with one of the five colleges of Strixhaven, a university of magic. These subclasses are special in that each one is available to more than one class. This makes a lot of sense when you look at the history of D&D and the term mage uh, can really be easily applied at this point to warlocks, to, boar, to, to bards, to druids, and to wizards. Um, you know, D&D has a lot more spellcasters now than it did when it started out. So I like this idea that these colleges that are in Strixhaven accommodate that in this sense. So, the colleges of Strixhaven has five subclasses. Uh, they're all in this document. They're designed for characters who are dedicated, who have dedicated themselves to one path of magic practiced at Strixhaven. The University of Strixhaven is a home to a wide variety of students and spellcasters. While individuals are welcome to pursue their magical studies in whichever way they please, some choose to focus exclusively on the fundamentals of one university's, you know, one of the university's five colleges. I think this is very freeing, and, and I think each of these colleges uh, has a very unique flavor that can accommodate multiple sub multiple classes in D D. So, and, and kind of speak to some elements that I really liked uh, in previous subclasses in D D that I wish ha were included with other subclasses. I I, I didn't like that that they were only like the Bard College of Eloquence, for instance has some really great features that I wish maybe uh, the Warlock had. Um, and, and this kind of accommodates that. So let's go ahead and jump in. We've got the Lorehold College dedicated to the pursuit of history by conversing with ancient spirits and understanding the whims of time itself. We've got the Prismari College dedicated to the visual and performing arts and bolstered with the power of the elements. I always like my timey-wimey stuff, so that's very exciting. We have the Quandric College, dedicated to the study of the manipulation of nature's core mathematic principles. We have Silver, Silver Quill College, dedicated to the magic of words, whether encouraging speeches that uplift allies or piercing wit that derides foes. This is my wheelhouse in terms of my character Averin, so I will be taking this college. Uh, we have Witherbloom College, dedicated to alchemy of life and death, and harnessing the devastating energies of both. Again, I'm really excited for all of these because I feel like they all have a little bit of elements from subclasses I previously very much enjoyed, and they are allowing some of those elements to bleed into, say, the Warlock subclass, or Bard, or Wizard, or Druid, because they do in fact make sense for these other classes to benefit from this. Um, 
They do mention this assigned using these subclasses. Unlike regular subclasses, the options presented here are designed to be compatible with multiple classes. The classes are compatible with each subclass option and are specified in each subclass entry. When you choose a subclass for your character, a bard's bardic college or a wizard's arcane tradition and so on, you can instead choose one of these subclass options so long as the subclass is compatible with your character's class. You can choose the subclass only once even if you multi-class into another class that is compatible with this subclass. Otherwise, this gets rather complicated very quickly. How the subclass manifests to your character's story is up to you. Perhaps your sorcerer's innate spark of elemental magic has been uh, detrimentally honed by the school, determinedly honed by the school ever since um, they f you first showed arcane potential. Or your warlock has skewed their patron's usual boons for learning these more esoteric manifestations of power. Maybe your druid chose to attend university instead of going and joining their druidic circle. Or your wizard balked at the traditional apprenticeship offered by their new, by their uh, current uh, uh, school of wizardry in favor of something more uh, newfangled. <laughs> I really like the wording in this, actually, quite a bit. So, uh, at higher levels, like regular subclasses, your subclass here chooses to grant your character new abilities at higher levels when your character would normally gain a new subclass feature uh, noted in your character's class table uh, you gain one of these features uh, actually instead but you have to re you do have to uh, meet the minimal requirements so there will be uh, some kind of interesting shift so what you'll see here in this unearthed arcana is there are a variety of abilities that say six plus or one plus or or 14th plus that means that you have to be at least that level when your class feature comes around to be able to take it so some of these you may have to wait longer uh, depending on what your class is and when you get those class options they describe it a little bit better here so all of the subclass features detailed here have a level prerequisite as noted beneath their name you must meet the prerequisite to gain that feature for example to gain a feature noted as 6th level or higher, your character must be 6th level or higher in that class for which the subclass has been chosen. So if you're a wizard, Mage of the Prismari subclass, you must be 6th level wizard to gain the favored medium feature. Um, when, and the, and another complication that can come up here is, when you reach certain levels, you might be eligible to choose a uh, from among multiple features in this subclass. When you reach such a point, you select one of these features for your character to gain. Um, unless otherwise specified, you can gain no more than one subclass feature at a time. For example, if you're a bard with the Mage Lore Hold subclass at 14th level, you gain your choice of either the War Echoes feature or the History of Whims feature, but you can't do both. I think that makes a lot of sense. So, Let's get into the subclasses. <laughs> these are really fun. I really like the design of these. Um, I, I, I'm sure there's going to be a little bit of polish later on, but I, I already adore this concept, and I want to see more of this perhaps in D&D. And I know uh, this is probably going to be a very controversial Unearthed Arcana, but I, I do like where they're headed with this, and I think it's daring. So... The mages of Lorehold are particularly concerned with the forces that underlie and drive history. Drawing inspiration from the scholars and adventurers of old, they manifest the arcane powers of the past through ethereal dioramas and fantastical battle prowess. Lorehold mages are often found with long-dead spirits summoned at their side who better learn ancient history to better learn ancient history. Uh, from that, you know, for who to learn better ancient history from then one who has experienced it firsthand. That's a bit hard to say out loud. Uh, fun to read, hard to say. Uh, so, using this subclass, upon selecting the Mage Lord Hold subclass, you gain two features Lore Hold spells and an ancient companion. In this subclass's features, any reference your class refers to the class from which you gain the subclass. If you're a bard, the College of Lorehold counts as your college. If you're a warlock, if you're a wizard, etc., etc. 
So when you reach a level of your class that gives you a subclass feature, you gain one of the features of your choice of the options presented here. Each feature has a class level prerequisite. Well, they do repeat this again and again. I think this is helpful because this is a rather new and complex way of, of uh, doing subclasses. So they, they are probably repeating this kind of information again and again for each of these individual subclasses. So at first level, lore hold spells. This is level one plus mage of lore hold feature. You learn the cantrip sacred flame. And at the first level spell, Comprehend Languages, you will learn additional spells when you reach certain levels in this class, as shown on the Lore Hold Spells table. Each of these spells counts as a class spell for you, but it doesn't count against the number of spells that you know. If you are a wizard, you can add these spells to your spellbook upon learning them, without expending any gold, and prepare them as normal. So, here are the spells. At third level, you get Knock, Locate Object. Fifth, you get Speak with with dead spiritual guardians seventh you get arcane eye and stone shape and ninth you get destructive wave and legend lore all all good spells all strong stuff and all themed very much towards statues and ancient spirits uh and discovering secrets so also at first level, we get Ancient Companion. You learn to call on the spirits of the ancient dead and house them temporarily in the remnants of old statues, so they may remain longer on this plane to bolster your studies and aid you in battle. This can, I imagine, have the Dungeon Master being asked multiple times if there is a statue nearby. I think uh, most Dungeon Masters will just have a statue appear to accommodate this feature, otherwise this becomes... Lots of asking if there's a statue nearby. Uh, I, I think you just gotta give it to him. So, when you finish a short or long rest, you can call forth a and bond with one such spirit who comes to inhabit a medium freestanding statue within 10 feet of you to serve as your ancient companion. See this creature's game statistics in the Ancient Companion stat block, which uses your proficiency bonus in several places. When you bond with your ancient companion, Choose the type of spirit you bond with, healer, sage, or warrior. Your choice of spirit determines certain traits in its stat block. That statue de determines the spirit's appearance. So this is almost like you're, you're bonding with a statue that almost becomes a gargoyle, a familiar, almost like a homunculus-like companion uh, for you, which is kind of adorable. And I think we've seen that a little bit in the Strixhaven artwork as well. So, the Ancient Companion is friendly to you and your companions and obeys your commands. Uh, in co combat, the Companion shares your initiative count, but it takes its turn immediately after yours. It can move and use its reaction on its own, but, that, but the only action it can take on its turn is the dodge action unless you take a bonus action on your turn to command it to take another action. This is all very familiar stuff. So... Moving on to the next page. All right. Uh, as an action, you can touch the Ancient Companion, expend a spell slot of first level or higher, and the Ancient Companion regains a number of hit points equal to 10 times your, the, the level of the spell slot you expended. The Companion perishes when it drops to zero hit points, when you're bond with a new Ancient Companion at the end of your short or long rest, or when you die. When the companion perishes, the spirit within returns to its plane of origin and the statue becomes an inert object. Again, very standard. You, know, you don't want to be spawning ancient statues everywhere you go. So, ancient companion. It's got an armor class of 14, natural armor, plus 2 if, you're, if it's the warrior type only. Uh, decent amount of hit points. This all scales. Uh, good saving throws. It's immune to poison. It's immune to being charmed, exhausted. It's got a decent passive perception. You know, it understands languages that you know, uh, and uh, its proficiency bonus is equal to the, to your bonus as well. We've got ancient fortitude. If damage if if damage reduces the companion to zero hit points, it can make a Constitution saving throw DC five plus the damage uh, taken, unless the damage is from a critical hit on a success. The companion drops. To one hit point instead. So we've got a little bit of a zombie mechanic here. This is a very tough little statue. Uh, Sage's Council. 
Why, within 15 feet of the companion, you and your allies get a plus two bonus to intelligence and wisdom checks. I like to think that this companion is uh, kind of chiming in. You know, if you're doing an arcana check or, or a wisdom check, it's kind of like pointing you in the right direction. And I like that it's benefiting everyone in the party. So it's like I can see the dungeon master role playing this, this statue gargoyle like character. Um, as it tries to benefit everyone around you. So I think this is very interesting. So it's got a couple actions here. We got uh, Spirit Strike. It's a melee attack, 1d8 plus 2 plus proficiency bonus, force damage. Very hard to save for. Healer is Light. This comes with the healer specifically. The companion chooses a creature it can see within 15 feet of itself and flares. Moving. And moreover, it flares invigorating light. The creature, the creature gains 1d8 plus the play, your proficiency bonus in temporary hit points. So again, this is all going to scale through you over time. Uh, we've got reactions. This is for the warrior only. Warrior's protection. When a creature within five feet of the companions makes a strength or dexterity saving throw, the companion imposes itself between the creature and the danger. The creature can roll a d4 and add the number rolled to the saving throw. This is a mechanic we're seeing more and more in D&D, this 1d4 being added to people's saving throws or proficiency checks. A little bit of a, a boost, still random, but definitely a benefit. And I like the wording of the creature imposes itself to try to help. Again, we have this kind of helpful little statue that's running around with you, and I imagine this thing doesn't have to be very large, so you can also probably keep a statue on you, uh, a small little statue, a figurine, perhaps uh, in a bag of holding with you that will always inhabit. Um, so I think that's fun. So lesson, lessons of the past. This is sixth level or higher, so again, if you are one of the subclasses that can get this if you're one of the classes that can get this subclass, you have to wait till level six. So, throughout your studies, you learn how to better listen and take heart in the teachings of history. When you bond with your ancient companion, you gain the following additional benefits depending on the type of spirit you choose. This is a very... Um, in, in a selection of subclasses that are very choice-driven, this is a very choice-driven subclass, right? <laughs> like, already you can choose multiple classes to add a subclass to, and then you have a lot of flavor that you can add after that. Uh, it, this is uh, an unearthed arcana that is all about personal choice for the player. So, If you chose the healer, your hit point maximum increases by an amount equal to your level in this class, and you gain the same number of hit points uh, and you gain the same number of hit points. When you regain hit points from a spell, you regain an additional 1d8 hit points. Makes you kind of tanky. Sage, you gain advantage on ability checks using arcana history, nature, and religion skills. Additionally, once per turn, when you deal damage to a creature with a spell of first level or higher, you can deal, deal an additional 1d8 force damage to that creature. Strong. This is not unlike being the artillerist. Only... It's not only, yeah, it's it's strong. This is a good one. Warrior, if you use your action to cast a cantrip, you can make one weapon attack as part of that action. If that weapon attack hits, the target takes an additional 1d8 radiant. This is very important because this wording, you may notice, is also in the Bladesinger subclass in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, the kind of alteration that I made here. So this makes it so you, uh, if you choose to do this, uh, you you can make this weapon attack uh, and do green flame blade, booming blade, uh, any of the way weapon based cantrips become far more effective now. Um, kind of makes you give you give gives a couple of people the option of being kind of a blade singer, really. So uh, it's pretty fun. I like this. Uh, when you bond with a new let me look, let me look at this one more time. If you use your action to cast a cantrip, you can make one weapon attack as part of that action. Yeah. 
Okay, yeah, this is, this is like multiple attacks. So you could do Green Flame Blade and then do a, a weapon attack as well in the same turn. So, it's interesting. Yeah, so you, you, you can kind of get that Blade Singer flavor from, uh, from choosing this. It's, it's, it's interesting. So you, you, you would hit someone with Green Flame Blade, that counts as a cantrip, or, you know, Firebolt also, or anything like that. But And then you could come in and hit them with a weapon attack, and then uh, do additional 1d8 radiant damage. Not really getting a bonus to uh, necessarily that weapon attack, though. So you might want to make sure you have a high dex or something, unless I'm reading this wrong. So when you bond with a new ancient companion of a different type, you immediately lose the benefits of your previous companion and gain the benefits of a new companion's type. So you can switch this up a couple times. War Echoes. Uh, 10th level plus Mage of Lorehold feature. By pulling from the magic of the past, you can cause your opponent's old wounds to to resonate anew. Once per turn, when a creature you can see hits a target with an attack roll, you can use your reaction to force the target to make a wisdom saving throw against your spell save DC. Uh, on a failure, the target becomes vulnerable to one type of damage. Dealt by the attack, this vulnerability lasts until the end of the target's next turn and affects the damage dealt by the triggering attack. That's rough. It makes you vulnerable at tenth. Um, to one of your, you know, one of your opponents becomes vulnerable. That's nasty stuff. That's doubling the damage. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I definitely want to try this in the future. Giving anyone vulnerability, vulnerability is extremely nasty, and we do not see this often. So I, I'm very, very curious. Vulnerability is uh, not often toyed with, and this is at 10th level. We can make someone vulnerable once per turn when a creature you see hits a target. With the attack roll, you can use your reaction to force the target to make a wisdom saving throw against your spell save DC. On a failure, failure, that target becomes vulnerable to one of the damage types dealt by the attack. And this vulnerability lasts until the end of the target's next turn. So what if it was just piercing damage? What if it was just slashing damage? And it lasts till the end of its... Poof. That feels strong. I mean, it's 10th level. But that is, like, a lot of damage. I feel like uh, the whole party is just going to r just wreak havoc, especially if you have a party that is like all in agreement. Like, okay, we all agree that we're gonna, we're just going to like bludgeon the crap out of this enemy, right? <laughs> uh, this this can like level a boss. Um, what if everyone? Woof! Yeah, it's really strong. Sorry, I, I'm having to take a moment with this. Wisdom saving throw against... I mean, certainly they get a wisdom saving throw. But there are a lot of things with low wisdom. And a lot of tanky creatures with low wisdom. So, yeah, well, more more on that later. Uh, I am going to do additional videos on YouTube that are going to kind of delve into these a bit more individually. So, yeah. Pretty nasty stuff. Uh, you, yeah, you can use your reaction in this way a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and, oof, and you regain all expended uses after a long rest. Nasty, nasty, nasty spot ability at level 10. History's Whims. Through steeping yourself in the chaotic whims of history, you learn how to briefly channel the wild nature of time itself. As a bonus action, you can enter a state of chronal chaos. When you enter this state at the start of each of your subsequent turns, while in this state you gain one of the following benefits of your choice. Luck. Receive brief flashes of the future, stealing yourself against oncoming assaults. Whenever you make a saving throw against an effect that deals damage, you can roll a d6 and add that number roll to the total. Very nice. Uh, resistance. You rewind time, knitting together injuries as they occur. You have resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. Very strong. Swiftness. Time stutters, slowing others, but hurling you forward. Your movement speed increases by 15 feet, and you do not provoke opportunity attacks. The benefit lasts until the start of your next turn. You cannot choose the same benefit two rounds in a row. 
the state lasts for one minute and ends early if you're incapacitated. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest or until you expend a spell slot fourth level or higher. Again, very strong. I feel like the 10th level feature is the nastiest of everything here. I feel like the 10th level feature might be the one that, that receives um, more attention later, but who knows? I could be wrong. So, that brings us to the mages, the Mage of Prismaria. This is for druids, sorcerers, and wizard subclasses. And I really, let me just jump up here really quick. I want to see... Yeah, the War Echoes. War Echoes is just... Uh, let's see, use this subclass. Connect. That was for... I've gotten a little bit lost here, actually. Uh, so, Luck. Moving up, moving up. We had the, the Ancient Companion. We had the Healer. Wow. That's really, really strong. Mages of Lore Hold, everybody. Okay, just 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 confirming. And again, Mages of Lore Hold, uh, that is something you can layer on to uh, why am I having so much trouble finding this? Warlock and Warlock Bard and Wizard subclass. So pr pretty powerful stuff. Okay. History's whims. All right. Uh, yeah, we saw that already. So let's go to do now Mage Prismaria. So Mage Prismaria is for Druid, Sorcerer, and Wizard subclasses. The Mages of Prismaria use surges of elemental energy to express who they are and how they see the world. To them, magic and motion are one and the same. Both are exhibitions of raw creativity through which masterpieces are made. In their pursuit of the arts, some Prismaria mages uh, focus on perfecting the fine details of their technique, while others prefer to unleash their wild creative visions in dazzling spectacles of elemental power. This had this, you know, this very much. You know, the mages of Prismaria, the druid, sorcerer, and wizard, gives them a little bit more of a bardic feel as I'm reading this right now, uh, which is very cool. You know, I, 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 much in the way like a blade singer is the warrior of wizards. This allows you to kind of make a druid or a sorcerer or a wizard that's a little bit more bardic, a little bit more performance based. So I think that's pretty fun. All right, using this subclass. Uh, we already know how to use this subclass. We've we've talked about this at length. So, creative skills. You gain proficiency in two of the following skills. Acrobatics, athletics, nature, or performance. Kinetic ancestry. You gain the dash as a bonus action. When you take this bonus action, you choose one of the following additional effects. So, you're, you're very quick. You're quick and nimble. Boreal sweep. Ice water swirls or icy water swirls around you until the end of your next turn. You can move across the surface of water as if it were harmless solid ground. Additionally, when you leave a space within five feet of a creature, you can force that creature to make a strength saving throw against your spell save DC. On a failed save, the creature is knocked prone, and the creature can be affected by by the water only once each turn. Okay, so this can only happen once each turn. A little reminiscent of the spell that we saw uh, in the Draconic options as well. So, again, you're taking this at dash action. This is fundamental to this subclass, and you have multiple options with dash. Scorching Whirl. Flames wreathe your steps once before the end of your turn. You can force each creature within five feet of you to make a dexterity saving throw against your spell save DC, Creature takes fire damage equal to 1d4 plus your spellcasting modifier. So this is exactly, basically exactly that spell that we saw in Draconic, Draconic Options um, previously. Uh, except for a couple of benefits. You know, you, you get to move a bit faster and stuff with that spell. So I'm wondering if that spell layers with this. And how that how effective that becomes? I don't have I don't remember the spell off the top of my head right now, but it was in the draconic options and was a I think it was flame stride um, that gave you a bonus to your movement speed um, and also allowed you to do fire damage to anyone around you. So 
Uh, and now the next option is Thunder Light Jaunt. You take on a nimble lightning form until the end of your next turn. You can move through space through the space of other creatures, and you don't provoke an opportunity attack. If you end your turn inside a creature's space, you are pushed into the nearest unoccupied space. All right, so we're avoiding that kind of force damage thing uh, that you take if you're inside an object. Uh, you use you can use this as a bonus action in this way a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. Very, very quick. Sorcerer, wizard, or druid. Uh, if you want to play a speedster, this seems kind of like the speedster class, subclass right now. Favored medium. You have honed, and this is at 6th level, you have honed uh, your forms of elemental expression to best suit your ideas. Choose one of the following damage types, cold, fire, or lightning. You gain resistance to that damage type. Additionally, when you cast a spell using a spell slot that deals the chosen type of damage, you emit a spectacular aura of artistry, which extends 5 feet from you in every direction. But not through total cover. And it lasts until the end of your next turn. While aura, this aura is active, each creature of your choice has resistance to your chosen type while within the aura as your shape is favored by an elemental medium around them. You can change your choice of damage type whenever you finish a long rest. It's decent. It's, it's solid and you can change it up. Um... Mm. It's interesting. I mean, it's not it's not quite spell sculpt, but it's it like I mean, if you've chosen to be fire and you can just when you cast a spell, you can make everyone resistant to it. That's very nice. Um, yeah, R reminds me a little bit of the evocation wizard uh, in some some regards, but you know, not as comprehensive. But um, yeah, I don't know. This is interesting. Like you you are one with the elements. Focus expression at tenth level, the major Prismaria feature. Honing your talents, you skillfully you skillfully infuse infuse your emotions with even more potent expressions of elemental might. Once per turn, when you deal damage to a at least one target, you gain an additional effect determined by the damage type for your favored medium. Again, all these subclasses so far have a ton of options uh, for you. <laughs> And you have so many options on top of this already and, and being able to choose whatever class you want to kind of like jump, put these on. So for cold, one of the targets of your choice takes on an additional 1d6 cold damage and must make a constitution saving throw against your spell save DC. On a failed save, the target's speed is reduced by 10 feet until the end of its next turn as the ice mires it. A target can be affected by the ice only once per round. Wow. It's pretty nasty stuff. So your spells become even more interesting. This really is the elemental list, which I you know kind of reminds me of the uh, Tome of Magic in, in in I believe second edition. But this is like it gives you a little fire. Uh, on all uh, one of the targets of your choice takes an additional one d six fire damage, fortifying flames. Then dance around one creature of your choice. Within 30 feet of you, the chosen creature gains 1d6 temporary hit points. Lightning. One of the targets of your choice takes an additional 1d6 lightning damage and must make a dexterity saving throw against your spell save DC. On a failed save, the target is unable to take reactions until the end of its next turn as residual lightning shocks its form. And at 14th level, we've got impeccable physicality. So... Your relentless dedication and training have instilled an outstanding sense of precision and grace in your art. You gain proficiency in dexterity saving throws if you do not already have it. Additionally, when you make a dexterity saving throw, you can treat a d20 roll of a 9 or lower as a 10. It's pretty nice. Yeah, so you are very dexterous. So this is really a dexterous, uh, you know, druid, sorcerer, or wizard. It, it, you're you're just good at not getting hit. This, though, it very much focuses on elemental magic. It does feel like a speedster in every way. You're just dexterity and performance are what you are good at. So it's interesting. Makes a makes a very fun damp here for sure. 
All right, let's go to the Mage of Quandrix. This is for sorcerers and wizard subclasses only. Uh, for those who become mages of Quandrix, math and magic go hand in hand. Such individuals learn to break down natural phenomena into their core numerical components. Through manipulating those alter reality on a whim, their talent ranges from tangible physics like multiplying plant growth and redistributing elements of probability and acceleration to bizarrely theoretical exercises that warp the fundamentals of space and uh, self. Uh, yeah, this is very much the physics science based wizard or sorcerer. And we'll go ahead and skip how to use this subclass. They do, I feel like it's important that they do remind people over and over again uh, exactly how. <laughs> so, um, Quandrix spells you learn the cantrip guidance at first level and also guiding bolt. You learn additional spells, uh, you know. You learn additional spells when you reach certain levels in this class. So let's go over those. You, uh, third level, enlarge, reduce, spike of growth. Uh, fifth level, aura of vitality and haste. Seventh, you got control, water, and freedom of movement. And ninth level, you have circle of power and pass wall. So, you, you are very much affecting physics. I see spike growth as like, okay, you've accelerated time for a plant, and now you have spike growth. Haste makes a lot of sense. Enlarge makes sense because you're changing the physics of things. Um, I'm a little surprised slow isn't in here, but that may come into play later. Uh, freedom of movement makes perfect sense. Circle, power, pass wall. So, functions of probability. At first level, by iterating one of the mathematical formulas, uh, but by iterating on the mathematical patterns of reality, you can nudge chance and tilt around the creature uh, when you cast a spell using a spell slot that targets at least one creature you can choose uh, that creature or another creature within 30 feet of it including yourself and add one of the following effects so again lots of options diminishing function the choose the chosen uh, creature must succeed on a, a wisdom saving throw uh, or the creature must roll a d6 and subtract that number rolled from the next attack roll it makes before the start of its next turn. Supplemental function. Once before the start of your next turn, the chosen creature can roll an actual an extra 1d6 and add that to an attack roll or a saving throw of its choice. The creature can roll the d6 after rolling the d20, but must, must decide so before any effects of the roll occur. This is very barbed college of eloquence in how its inspiration functions in that you can give someone a boost by saying something or you can give someone a negative by saying something and you are getting this at first level hmm so that brings us to velocity shift you learn to manipulate kinetic formulas and alter the velocity of another creature we got a lot of timey-wimey speed stuff in here. Um, so creatures you can see, a uh, creature you can see starts its turn or moves to a space within 30 feet of you. You can use your reaction to force the creature to make a charisma saving throw against your spell save. On a failure, the creature is teleported to an unoccupied space of your choice you can see within 30 feet of you. Use your reaction this way a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus and regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. Very, very weird and tricksy. Um, boy, do I want to break out the miniatures on this character already. <laughs> you're really going to have to... Because that could mean, mean life or death, right? Like, if you're in a, in a fight around, like a, on a cliff, and they fail that saving throw, and they're just like... Mm, or you're out, like on the battlement of a castle, this is highly effective. Uh, you are kind of determining how people come at you. Certainly very good in the siege. Uh, or controlling uh, a certain amount of space. So, oh, okay. well, well, yeah, that slow is already included, so it's not, not like every sorcerers and wizards do automatically get slow anyway. So it's not a benefit. So that's that's certainly a good point. So, yeah, of course. Uh, null equation level ten. Uh, through careful calculations, you beset your enemies with abstract equations that reduce their might. Once per turn, you immediately after uh, immediately after dealing damage to a creature, you can force that creature to make a Constitution saving throw. On a failure, the creature has dis disadvantage on Strength and Dexterity saving throws. 
and its weapon attacks deal only half damage. These effects last until the start of your next turn. You gain use of this feature a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus. You regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. This very much mirrors the other ability where we saw that you made somebody completely vulnerable to a type of damage it took, either from yourself or somebody else using your reaction. This is making it less effective at 10th level also, um, in that it's basically only doing half damage to everyone around it. You have two people of this school, you complete can really completely lock down a target like they're dealing half damage and they're taking double double damage if you have two people of these two different schools that we are already seeing in them in this unearthed arcana so there's a there's definitely a theme here um this null equation is very much uh almost the opposite of what we are seeing uh from that previous subclass that you know made somebody vulnerable to a type of damage all right, so we've got quantum tunneling. Your math mathematical expertise extends to altering the foundational equations of your very being. You gain resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. Additionally, you can move through other creatures and objects as if they were difficult terrain, but you take 1d10 force damage for every 5 feet that you move while inside another creature or object. If you end your turn inside a creature or object, you are shunted into the nearest unoccupied space that you last occupied. Again, we are seeing a lot of um, moving things around in this Unearthed Arcana. We're seeing uh, annoying, you know, we're seeing ignoring, like, difficult terrain or turning people into difficult terrain when you or, or objects into difficult terrain. We, we're seeing a lot of control powers. We're seeing a lot of amplifying damage, reducing damage, um, lots of movement and control from all these subclasses. Uh, almost equally, I would say. So, uh, let's see. Mage of the Silver, Silver Quill, and this is something I'm very, very excited for. We've got this for bards, warlocks, and wizards. Uh, the Mages of the Silver Quill hone the power of words. And this immediately feels like the Bard College of Eloquence again. A little bit. Um, they can channel the magic of light and shadow through words, whether spoken aloud or written or signed through gestures. I like that they say, or signed through gestures. I, I think this is a good nod to accessibility. The words of a mage of the sil Silver Quill bring salvation to their allies or despair to their enemies. Again, very, very thematic to the Bard College of Eloquence. Is this available for bards? Let's take a look. I believe it was, wasn't it? Bard, Warlock, or... The wizard subclass. I mean, not available to the Bard College of Eloquence, but it's available to Bards, I should say. Sorry, I misspoke. So, um, we'll skip how to use the subclass. Eloquent Apprentice. It's a level 1 plus mage silver quill feature. You learn one cantrip of your choice. Either Sacred Flame or... Sacred Flame came up again. Uh, Sacred Flame or Vicious Mockery. It doesn't count against the number of cantrips you know, and it is added to the class spell list if it isn't already there. You know, Vicious Mockery being uh, someone who's a bit of a trickster, who can kind of uh, talk a mean game and get someone upset, makes sense for this. Absolutely. And it's literally called the Eloquent Apprentice. So, Additionally, you gain proficiency in your choice of deception. Intimidation, performance, persuasion, or insight. Yeah, here we go. So, silvery barbs. I need one moment. This is a lot of talking. A little, little bit of water. Ooh, I'm going to try to get all th through all these. All right. Silvery Barbs. You can invoke the words laced with magic to demoralize your foes and turn their misfortune into a boon to bolster your allies. Immediately after a creature you can see within 60 feet of you succeeds on an attack roll and an ability check or an, you know, an ability check or a saving throw, you can use your reaction to demoralize the creature unless that creature is immune to being charmed. It rerolls the d20 and must use the lower roll. This is nasty at first level. Holy cow. If the attack roll, ability check, or saving throw then fails, you then choose a different creature you can see within 60 feet of you. You can choose yourself. 
that creature is empowered and you can reroll one attack roll ability check or saving throw um, it makes within one minute and use the higher result so kind of advantage a creature whew, that's first level not only did you try to like cause problems for a car- for another uh, creature but you also get a benefit if it didn't work uh, empowered only by the use of this feature um, at a time. Once a creature fails an attack roll, an ability check, or a saving throw because of a reroll forced by this feature, you can't use the feature again until you finish a long rest unless you expend a spell slot to do so. Yikes! Yeah, look at that. And you're forcing someone to reroll. You know, if they if if they fail, let's see. Immediately after the creature you see within sixty feet, if you on the attack roll, ability check, or a save in the throw, you can use your reaction to demoralize it. Unless the creature is immune to being charmed, it re-rolls that d twenty, and it has to use the lower roll. If the attack roll or the ability check or saving throw then fails, you can choose a different creature, including yourself. So you really like if that you cause them to fail, you really gain benefit from it. So it's it, it's particularly nasty. If you succeeded in your attempt to make it fail, and then you get these additional benefits for causing it to fail. So this is like really mean. (laughs) I love it. Um, I would very much adopt this for my own character. I think. Uh, Yeah, I I love the the ability. Uh, I want to definitely want to play test this. Uh, Yeah, that's fun. All right. So moving on, we've got Inky Shroud. I like the dark stuff. This is six level or higher. You learn the darkness spell, and it's added to your class spell list as well. Uh, you can cast a spell without expending a spell slot, and you can't. Uh, but then you can't do so uh, until you finish a long rest. When you cast the spell, though, in this way, we're getting into some warlock stuff. When you cast the spell in this way, you can see normally through the darkness created. And when a creature you can see starts its turn in that darkness, you deal two d10 psychic damage to that creature. You can also cast the spell normally without the additional effects by using a spell slot you have of second level or higher. Yeah, I feel like this was made for me. Um, <laughs> uh, that's nasty. Uh, it's interesting. I, you know... Because at first I was like, well, it is called the Silver Quill. So not, not only are you a- able to talk to people and say nasty things, I like the idea, you know, Quill, Ink, creating this inky shroud. Uh, I think this is very fun. I think this is a very nasty darkness. I think this is the darkness, the sorcerer, uh, shat- you know, uh, Shadowfell sorcerer basically should have had. Uh, uh, this is much stronger, more, more fun. Yeah, I like it. I, I, I like it a lot. Uh, so, infusion of eloquence. We're back into the eloquence of this all. Uh, when you cast a spell that damage that deals damage, you can invoke the additional words of power to change the spell's damage type to your choice of psychic or radiant. Makes a lot of sense. Any creature damaged by the spell takes extra damage equal to your proficiency bonus and has its emotions swayed with either despair or adoration based on the damage type type dealt. If you're doing psychic damage, damage the creature is frightened of you until the start of your next turn. If you decide to do radiant damage, the creature is charmed by you until the start of your next turn. You can cho- use this feature a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and you gain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. Wow. Ah, uh, let's think about that for a second. Um, mm-hmm. Again, this is for bards, warlocks, or wizards. The infusion of eloquence. When you cast a spell that deals damage, you can invoke the additional words of power to change the spell's damage type to the choice of psychic or radiant. Any creature damaged by that spell takes extra damage equal to your proficiency bonus. So... A little bit of a evocation wizard at this point. Doing a little bit of extra damage. Um, and it deals psychic or radiant. So you hit someone with a fireball, but it's a psychic fireball, and everyone's frightened by you. 
Or you create a Radiant Fireball and the creature is charmed by you until the end of the start of your next turn. This can shut a lot down. This is the law of crowd control. Uh, yeah. I do love it, though. Oh, very interesting. Wow. It's interesting that they like they associate radiant damage with being charmed. I do find that interesting. Okay, so you can use yeah you can use this feature a number of times equal to your profi proficiency bonus. There are a lot of ways to be, to manipulate this. These subclasses are interesting. They borrow a little bit from like I think a lot of subclasses, uh, but makes some of these abilities unique. Uh, yeah. I really like this. I'd be sorely tempted not to play this subclass, frankly. So, Words of Power. 14th level Mage Silver Quill feature. You can invoke the Words of Power. That is the pinnacle of your magical study. You gain the following options. I'm terrified. <laughs> this, this, this is already a very, very scary uh, spellcaster. Deadly Despair. When the target of your Silvery Barbs fails an attack roll, an ability check, or a saving throw because of the reroll, you, and this is tied into your first level ability, uh, you can invoke a Word of Despair to give the target vulnerability to one damage type while we're back in on vulnerability. Woof. Uh, to one damage type of your choice until the start of your next turn. You just make this, this creature... Vulnerable, that means it's taking twice as much damage uh, from that damage type until the next turn, uh, until the start of your next turn. So, working with others, letting them know what you're going to make it vulnerable to. Yeah, this is 14th level, but this gets nasty. So, selfless invocation. When a creature you can see within 60 feet of you takes damage, you can invoke a word of power using your reaction to grant the creature resistance to that damage type. And you take an amount of psychic damage equal to that damage that the creature takes. Kind of reminds me of the um, a little bit of the Paladin uh, Oath of Redemption in that fact. Boy, I really like this. I really like this uh, give and take, psychic damage, charming, uh, affecting people's roles. It is uh, kind of being the Bard College of Eloquence, but for everyone. And I think that tracks. It's very interesting. A lot of food for thought. This is probably one of my favorite subclasses in UA in, 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 a, in a minute, for sure. Uh, very tempted by this. Especially the fact that I can add this to a warlock, which I think are particularly good at fast talking. Uh, it, what's funny about all these subclasses is it's going to take time to kind of see and play test and see kind of like uh, the manipulations that you can do. Um, with all of this. Um, so. Mm, yeah. So this is... Um, if you want to play a very bardic warlock or a very bardic wizard, you, you have this option. Or a bardy bard. <laughs> so. All right. Mage of the Wither Bloom. Druid or warlock subclasses specifically, not wizards. So. Mages of a winter bloom draw on their magic from the energy that endlessly flows from life, life to death, and back again. They see a duality of thriving life, inevitable, inevitable death, and all things tapping and manipulating the transition of energy between these states. Some winter bloom ad, uh, adherents focus on vital energies to nurture life and empower others, while others embrace and drain the vitality into decay and sap, sap and strike down their foes. So, Winter Bloom at first level. You learn the cantrip Spare the Dying and also Cure Wounds and Inflict Wounds. You gain additional spells when you reach certain levels. So, uh, moving ahead. Moving ahead. Levels in this class as shown below Winter Bloom. So, here are your additional spells Lesser Restoration, Ray of Enfeeblement, Revivify, Vampiric Touch, Blight. Greater Restoration, Anti-Life Shell, which is nasty, uh, and Mass Cure Wounds. Interesting that Resurrection is not in here. Um, but yeah. 
So, Essence Tap, level 1 as well. As a bonus action, you can draw on the Reservoirs of Life Essence to empower yourself for one minute or until you use this feature again. For the duration, you gain one of the following benefits for your choice. Overgrowth. When you choose this benefit, you as a bonus action on subsequent turns. While the benefit lasts, you can expend a roll. Uh, you can expend and roll one hit die. You regain a number of hit points equal to the number rolled plus your spellcasting modifier. Get a little tanky. Withering Strike. When you deal damage, you can change the damage type to necrotic, and you ignore resistance to necrotic damage. Yikes. Um, life and Death. Personified. Uh, you can use this this a uh, number of times equal to your proficiency bonus. Certainly saw this a lot in Tasha's. Certainly there's something being used moving forward. Wither Bloom Brew. So now you're kind of a bit of a witch's brew type of thing. Uh, you gain proficiency with the herbalist kit, as you should. Uh, you finish a long rest. You can use an herbalism kit and a pot or a cauldron and create a magical brew. You create a number of brews equal to your proficiency bonus. Each brew requires its own flask. A brew retains its magical potency for 24 hours until it's used. For each brew, choose one of the following effects. So, diving into the Artificer Alchemist a bit. Fortifying. When a creature creates this brew, choose a damage type of the following list. Cold, fire, necrotic, poison, or radiant. A creature can drink this brew and or administer it to another creature as an action. Full action. The recipient gains resistance to the chosen damage type for one hour. That's good. So this is good for preparing. Encourage your fellow party members to actually drink your potions. I know alchemists run into this problem all the time. So... Quickening. A creature can drink this brew or administer it to another creature as an action. The recipient gains 2d6 hit points, and one disease or condition from the following list is removed. So, charmed, frightened, paralyzed, poisoned, or stunned. Toxifying. As an action, a creature can apply this brew to a weapon. The next time the weapon or a piece of ammunition is fired, it hits a target within one hour. Uh, the, the target takes 2d6 points of damage, poison, and must succeed a constitution saving throw against it, or be poisoned for one minute. So, very alchemist in feel. Uh, we've got Winter Bloom Adept, your connection to the flow of life and death. Uh, you know, life force deepens once per turn. You can deal necrotic damage or, or restore hit points using a spell. One target of the spell takes additional damage or regains additional hit points equal to your proficiency bonus. Your connection... Wait. Your connection to the flow of life deepens. Once per turn, when you deal necrotic or restore hit points using a spell, one target of the spell takes additional damage or regains additional hit points equal to your proficiency bonus. Okay, so we're seeing again, and we've seen this multiple times in this Unearthed Arcana, I think, well, well at least once before, your proficiency bonus being added to your damage. Um... Uh, much like, you know, say an evocation wizard adding its intelligence modifier or something like that. Um, so the, this 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 is mir a mirrored in other abilities, but now this is also a benefit for the healing itself. Uh, interesting stuff. So we do have withering vortex, and I need to move things a bit to accommodate you seeing that real quick so i apologize for the delay this is being taped live so if you're watching this on youtube thank you for um putting up with that okay so let me physically move it in my live stream <laughs> withering for uh withering vortex it's level 14 or higher when you cast a spell using a spell slot that deals necrotic damage to any number of creatures that aren't undead or constructs Choose one of the creatures that took the damage. You drain an amount of life equal to half the damage dealt. Uh, one creature other than yourself or that you can see within 30 feet of you regains a number of hit points equal to that. So you can have, you can drain the life of a creature for yourself or for someone else you can see. And you can do this a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus. Interesting. Nasty. I mean, I love vampiric touch, so you're not going to get any arguments from me. And that is the end of our Unearthed Arcana. Woo! Did we do it all? Did we seriously do all of these? 
I yikes. That was a lot. Um, in a good way. I'm not complaining. Okay. Well, uh, thank you all for sticking around. I can't believe I went over five subclasses by myself. I don't think I missed any. Uh, let me know in chat if I did, but I don't think I did. Um, yeah. So, like I, like we said, we got a whole bunch of subclasses here. Uh, again, I didn't have, uh, uh, I didn't get any insider looks on this under Earth uh, kind of anything. So uh, I, I am, uh, I am absorbing this information as you are absorbing it at home. But I, I'm really impressed with this is very daring stuff. It's by Mackenzie De Armas, who is a fantastic subclass designer. Um, who I've had the privilege of working with uh, previously in the past. We've got Dan Dillon. We've got Jeremy Crawford. I think this is very daring design. Um, I think it's what you like to see. I think this Unearth Arcana definitely needs playtest. Um, that does not mean that I feel that in any way this any of this stuff is flawed. I mean that this is uh, potentially so complex and freeing for people and the ability to stack these powers with different subclasses and finding different iterations of it and how to use it is fascinating it is something i kind of want for DD moving forward i don't know if um there'll ever be a sixth edition or anything like that but like i imagine there are just some core concepts in D D that when it comes to subclasses i feel like could be applied to multiple classes i see this when we look at um, you know, the Feywild Warlock, right? The Pact of the Feywild. Like, we can easily have a Fey Sorcerer, right? Like, wouldn't that be thematic? Couldn't we have used some of those powers for that Sorcerer? You know, when we look at the, the Shadow Sorcerer, shouldn't, couldn't those Shadow powers moved on to a Warlock? Um, or even a Wizard? Like, the... I, I feel like, I, and I know like people like to have their subclass identities very fixed, but this is your character. You're the one fixing it. And I, I, I do feel like there are certain inherent themes that are universal, like fire, fey, the shadow fell, uh, order and chance. I, 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 and um, certainly you don't want every subclass, every class to be able to have the exact same features uh, as they progress, but uh, I do like this. I think this is extremely daring design. Um, I think it shakes things up a bit. I, I'm definitely going to be thinking a lot about this and, and producing more videos about this for sure. Uh, I'm really happy with it. I, I really love that sil sil silver quill stuff. It is nasty. Uh, lower hold college. Uh, making anyone... Making any target uh, vulnerable to a type of damage is horribly nasty stuff. So um, I feel I, I I do feel like that's pretty powerful attempt. Uh, but who can say? Um, I am not a subclass designer of any note r remotely. I'm not uh, particularly good at mechanics. I feel like I'm okay with concept. Prismari College is 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 very strong and fun. Um, not only as a performer, but also as almost like a speedster wizard or sorcerer or, or, or whatever you choose. Uh, Quandrix is really fun. I like the mathematics of it. Silver, Silver Quill College is, is um, my favorite subclass. Uh, it's the subclass I would be... It's very difficult for me not to take in a very, very big way. Uh, Winter Bloom is obviously alchemy for... for uh, several subclasses and I like that I almost wish Winter Bloom would lean heavier into alchemy but you don't want to eat the alchemist lunch all these subclasses do kind of delve into other subclasses territory a, a wee bit when you look at you know El the, the Bard College of Eloquence um, when you look at um, changing elemental powers you know like or the scribe uh I don't feel like they conflict with them. I feel like they are taking inspiration, giving you more options. And I agree with it. Because if people want these things, they want them. And give them the option to give feedback about that. Just like we had like the Warlock Undying, and then we had the Warlock Undead. And some people were upset that the two existed. I'm like, well, the Warlock Undead is my preferred one. Maybe someone prefers the Warlock Undying. I like these options. And I like that you can add these to any subclass. Um, 
I'm just very, I applaud uh, uh, this entire team for making something this daring and exciting and uh, interesting. So that's all I got to say. And certainly, yeah, uh, it, it, it's not a secret that some of these people are my friends, but <laughs> like, th- this is great. Uh, I, I'd like to see D&D taking big risks and big swings. And these, this is a big swing and a big risk and very fun. And this is all about giving players more agency and more control about the type of character they want to play. And so if they're doing that, I'm all in. So, all right. Well, that's the stream. I got to get back to my other job. Uh, I thought I'd take my lunch break to talk about Honor of Thracana. I really appreciate you taking the time. If you're watching this on YouTube, sorry for that. It's an entire hour-long video about Honor of Thracana. But I will be coming out with individual uh, deep dives into each one of these subclasses uh, later on as well uh, that will be a little bit more short form than say a full hour uh, thank you so much for watching i uh i really appreciate all of you don't forget to like subscribe follow me on twitch um got a couple of emotes as well so i appreciate everyone watching i i love talking about D and uh th- thank you everyone in chat sorry i wasn't able to get to any questions because we had five subclasses to burn through but uh, this is one of the most exciting on Earth Arcanas I think we've seen in a very long time uh, for its audacity in a good way. Um, I, I really want to pick everyone's brains about this subclass so much, uh, these subclasses. It's fantastic. Have a great day, everyone. Uh, I will talk to you soon.